All right. Good morning. Uh, it's Thursday, and um, I'm hearing the rain drop down around here. I think it's going to rain all day, and uh, I can hear it. Sounds nice. I, I like rain. I mean, I you know I'm, I, I like I like life. So, uh, but the rain sounds good, and uh, enjoying the, the sound of that. And we had a great time last night at the River Campus of Eden Westside. Baptist Church, um, man, it's just a great group of people. Uh, I, I love, I love the interaction with them. I love their their hunger for the word. <clears throat> it's a really, really good, good time, and uh, I, I loved everything about last night. And uh, tonight, uh, we're planning on uh, heading out to our favorite little coffee shop uh, in Springville, Nichols Nook. And um, man, the people there—it's just a great place. It uh, feels like church when you go hang out at that coffee shop. Um, Beth and, and Scott are incredible hosts there at the, at, the, at the coffee shop, and it's just a good place to gather. So we're going to be doing that tonight. And uh, today's, uh, I always say myself out loud, today's donut day, so I don't forget to go get the donuts on my way to work. Uh, I do a safety meeting. I get all my guys together. We uh, chat, and uh, I usually share a little bit of the, the truth. Uh, give out donuts, make sure they sign the, their uh, attendance sheet, and good to go. So anyway, it's going to be a great day. And I uh, hope everything's good in your world and uh, praying for you guys that uh, God would be magnified in us and that we would rest in his sovereignty and, uh, and breathe through this day. Uh, listen, there's no surprises with the God of the universe. So your life and whatever turn it could potentially take today uh, did not catch God off guard. So the comfort of that is we just breathe. And uh, it's a great life to live when you live in the shadow of, of the sovereignty of God. And so that's where we are. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the book of Galatians this morning, though, chapter 3. We're kind of cranking through it. I think we'll finish up chapter 3 Monday, and then, uh, then we're halfway through. We have uh, three more chapters uh, to go after that. Rich, just good stuff, good truth. Uh, and I hope you're not um, hope you're not bored. Hope you're not confused about what we've been looking at as it relates to the law and its purpose. So, just to clarify, again, uh, Paul is dealing with a group of people who are Gentiles. That is, they're not Jewish. A lot of these Gentiles would know nothing of uh, the Old Testament, of all of that. Uh, and so, Paul sweeps in. He and Barnabas and uh, Titus, and they proclaim the gospel there. Uh, it's rooted and driven into their life. The Spirit of Christ is alive in this in these churches. Remember, it's a, little, it's a group of house churches. Galatia is a region, not a city. Several churches within that. Paul's writing to all of those, and and they're seeing miracles take place among themselves. It's just it's a rich place. Judaizers came in, however, those of the circumcision, and uh, and demanded that faith isn't enough. It's great that you believe in Jesus, but you got to keep the law. It's Abraham and Moses, right? And so they, they keep wanting to prop that up, knowing that they themselves haven't even been able to keep the law either. It's just a, it's a, it's a ploy by Satan. Uh, that's why Paul uses the term, who has bewitched you. That is, who has put you under a spell. Because he knows this isn't truth. This is darkness that someone is propagating. And he sees it and hears about it among the churches in Galatia. And so he writes this letter. And so now we look in chapter 3, he's laying out the case. And I'm just going to review real quickly. Verse 1 to 5. We looked at it yesterday. But verse 1 to 5. You already have experienced the Holy Spirit. You didn't, you didn't have all these works. That's new to you now. You came to Christ by faith in him and his complete work on the cross. And the Spirit of Christ was given to you. You have the Holy Spirit. So, so how did you get that Spirit? Did you get it by keeping the law? If you already have it, why then are you going to start worrying about keeping commandments and making sure that you're circumcised and making sure that you keep the Sabbath and all the festivals and make sure you keep the, the law. And then he says, verse 6 and 9, salvation has always been by faith. Just look at the Abrahamic covenant. It was about faith that God reckoned it to him as righteousness when he believed God. It had nothing to do with anything else. It was at the beginning of his journey. If you follow me, and he did, and he, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. When he uh, took a Isaac to the altar, 
uh, knowing that, man, that's the son of the promise. God will raise him from the dead or something's going to happen. He didn't waver in that. By faith, he believed that God was going to complete the promise. It's credited to him as righteousness. Then he says in, in verse 10 and 14 of chapter 3, not even the Mosaic law changed that. Because after Moses, 430 years later after Abraham, the law was there. And, and still, it didn't save the people. They still were wrecked. They still were... Um, heading into exile, they still had judges to, to rule them because they kept this cycle of sin going. Oh, we love Jesus, our God, and then and then into sin. And there was that cycle. So much so that Habakkuk reminds everybody at the end of this, right before the exiles, that uh, the righteous shall live by faith. So he, Habakkuk wasn't preaching, we got to do better with the law. We got to figure this thing. No, it's by faith. And then, then verse fourteen, if the promise was, uh, if the promise was Jesus, salvation is in Him and through Him, and that was His whole point. That's what we, that's what we looked at. Now, uh, so we're going to be in verse nineteen now. So if you got your Bible, uh, however you're looking at it, you can get to that place. We're going to be there. Uh, why the law then? This is the question that we answer today. What's the law's purpose? Now it's going to take us a couple of days maybe a few more, to really understand it. But, but I, I, as we were thinking through this, I thought about the, the covenants of God and just want to remind you of these things. There's the Abrahamic covenant. It's a promise. Remember, we talked about it. He laid two halves of animals down in a row. Abraham, God put him to sleep because it's a, it's a covenant, not a contract. And and he walked among them, right? And and so it was a promise. It was a promise that that Abraham's seed, Jesus, would bring salvation. That's That was the point. The seed, Abraham's seed, not seeds, but seed, that is Christ, uh, would, would pave way for all men to be saved, for all nations, the Gentiles, the Jews, and all the other, right? So then the Mosaic Covenant, that, that was a covenant that clarified what sin was. It points us to uh, really a hopelessness to keep it, right? I mean, we that's what Paul says in Romans. I, I didn't even know what sin was until the law. And then it was it was like all I wanted to do was that. It was like some, something clicked within me. What, what was happening in Paul? He was realizing that this sin is a bigger deal. It's a prison. And now that he now that he knows what it is, he says, I feel it's just weird, but I'm drawn to it. I know I shouldn't, but but I do. I know the things I ought to do that the law says I should do, and I don't want to do that either. And so we find that the Mosaic Covenant, it clarified sin. It says this is your issue. This is why it has to be by faith. So you have the Abrahamic Covenant, and then you have the Mosaic Covenant, which was blessings and cursings. If you keep these laws, you're going to be blessed. If you don't, you're going to be cursed, right? And so what, and we're going to see in a minute what the purpose of that was. And then there was the Davidic covenant. God gave David a covenant, 2 Samuel 7. You can read about that on your own. And it is that, that there would be a king after him, that one of his descendants would rule forever. And so the covenant he made with David is, uh, is through your house, that the seed is going to show up. It's through your house that this seed will be a king. It is your house that this king would be our savior, Messiah, king, right? And so there's that Davidic comment. He made a promise. David didn't have anything to do with that promise. Again, we're back to, to a, an Abrahamic type deal. That covenant was just God saying, here's what I'm going to do. Not, if you do this, I'll do that. That was that was true of the Mosaic. And then we have the New Covenant, right? And that's what the prophets began to speak of, Jeremiah, right? That there's going to be a New Covenant. And that New Covenant would mean that our sins would be forgiven, that we would be, have, that have our heart replaced with a stone, a, 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 a heart, a stone of a heart of stone replaced with a heart of flesh. And he would put his spirit within us and he would write his law on our heart. That is that the spirit would, would make that magnified in us. And so what is that new covenant about? How is it given? By faith. And so we see it everywhere. If, if we were to go to um, 2 Corinthians um, 1, we, and I, I know I'm kind of going around, but I just, it's important that we see these things. In, in 2 Corinthians um Chapter 1, it says, For as many as the promises of God are, and we just looked at those, the Abrahamic promise, the Davidic promise, the new covenant, the promise of that. For as many as the promises of God are, 
in him, not in you and me doing anything, in him they are yes and amen, right? What, what, what does that mean? What promises he to? We, people take this verse and they pervert it. Oh, God promised me this. God promised me money. God promised me in him this yes. No. What are the promises of God? They're, they're, it's the Abrahamic promise. It's the Davidic promise. It's the new covenant promise. In him, in him, they're all yes. How are they answered in him? How was the Abrahamic promise answered in Jesus? How was the, really the, the Mosaic covenant? How was it answered in Jesus? That's where we find perfection. That's where we find the law kept in him. Uh, how about the Davidic covenant? In him. That's who's going to become king. How about the new covenant? In him. That's who's going to enable us and give us the spirit of Christ, right? Now he who has established us with you in Christ and anointed us in God, who also seals us and gave us his spirit... Uh, as our as a pledge, I just man, this is powerful. I just wanted us to to see that before we jump into the text. Now, if that made all sense to you, let's go back to um, Galatians three nineteen. And so here's what he says: What? Why the law then? It was added on account of the violations having been ordered through angels at the hand of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise has been made. He said, it's just a side track waiting for the promise to be made. What, what then is the law? It was given to us to demonstrate how sin imprisons us. That's the whole point of the law. If we were to make it so, that's the whole point. Israel proved over the course of history that they couldn't keep it, right? Right? I mean, we, 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 we get to uh, Joshua. They go in. They begin to start taking the land. And God's very specific. Don't take anything in the land. More rule, more law, right? And what happened? Achan took land the very first time. Uh, he, took, he took stuff that wasn't supposed to take. Remember? And at AI, they, uh, they think there's going to be an easy battle. And it's not. They get slaughtered. And they go, what happened? He said, Cause, and God said to Joshua, because somebody violated the, the law that I gave about taking plunder from Jericho. And it landed on Achan. And Achan and his family were all stoned and thrown over a cliff uh, and, and, and all their goods with them, right? So the, Joshua, the, the book of Judges, all of the book of Judges is simply the cycle of Israel. They boo, they love Jesus. Yes, we do. You know, love we love Jesus. How about you kind of thing? We love God, you know. And, and then they would begin to worship idols, and they would drift into rebellion, and then God would send a deliverer, a judge, and then they would be righteous for a moment, and then it would be that cycle. <clears throat> when the kings came along, and David, the kingdoms after David continued to rebel against God so that the northern kingdom ended up going into exile. Why? Because God says, if you don't keep these commandments, it curses upon you. And so they ended up serving uh, another country. And then the southern kingdom did the same thing. So that by the time we get to the New Testament, Israel has been a colossal failure at being perfect before a holy God, right? That That's what's going on. Now, um, I, I found it fascinating. I was telling Tammy uh, earlier, my wife, <clears throat> that, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I learned something. I, I never really paid attention to the fact that there were angels there, but it gives it the, the, the aspect of that mountain of Sinai. You remember what happened there, right? Uh, God told Moses, hey, listen, keep the people back. They can't approach the mountain because if they do, they're going to die. And then there's this thunderous peal of, of lightning and thunder and, and all of this stuff coming on. And Moses ascends to that mountain. And in the midst of that, I thought it was he and God. You miss it. Listen to what he says. Uh, in, in uh, Deuteronomy 33. Now, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the sons of Israel before his death. He said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone from Mount Paran and he came from the midst of myriads of holy ones. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. So God comes down and there's a myriad of angels around him. So when we get to this passage in in uh, in, in Galatians 3.19, he speaks of the, the angels as mediators. This is what's going on. And it pops up there. It pops up when, when in, the, in the Psalms in 68.17. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands, 
The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. God has this huge entourage, myriads of these chariots of God, angels. That's what, that's what this is. That's what he's speaking of there. Stephen, when he was preaching in Acts chapter 7, this is the one who was in the assembly in the wilderness together with the angel who spoke to him at length on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living words to pass on to you. He's preaching about Moses and he brings up these angels again. And then you see in Hebrews chapter 2, for if the if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable at every violation and act of disobedience received a just punishment. And he goes on to list some other things. So you see that at Mount Sinai, these angels were there and they actually had an encounter with Moses and spoke to him. And so it says, why then the law? It was added on account of the violations, having been ordered through angels at the hand of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. They needed a mediator at this point. And this is, this is what would uh, God allow the angels in that sense to be a mediator? Listen, if it's a promise, no, no mediator is needed. That's why, that's why it says this. Uh, now a mediator is not for own, for is now a mediator is not for one party only, but God is only one. So what he's saying is, listen, why was there a mediator? Because it was a contractual thing, the Mosaic law. If you keep the, but, but the Abrahamic promise wasn't, there's no contract. We can't keep the law. By faith we believe, and it's reckoned to us as righteousness, right? We, the same thing with the Davidic promise. We waited for a Messiah, and he came. There was no nothing. We didn't have to do anything in order for him to come. It was a promise. It had nothing to do with us. No mediator needed. David, uh, I'm going to, out of your loins is going to come the Messiah. The new covenant, by faith, the just shall live by faith. This is all the way through here. Paul is making a case here that the law needed a mediator because someone was going to mete out the punishment if this contract is violated. The other, we even though we're unfaithful, he remains faithful. Remember those passages? We don't always connect them in the right way, but that's what that means. He's always faithful to his promise. And so it says, verse 20, now a mediator is not for one party only, but God is only one. What's he saying? Hey, listen, the mediator was needed because of our sin. Verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Is the law in, in opposition to the promises of God? It's like, oh, we used to, we used to the promise was by faith and now it's by law. Paul's saying, is that, is that, is that what you think is going on? No, no, that's not what's happening. Um, he says, it's incapable of giving life. He says, the law then, contrary to the promises of God, far from it. For if we had, if, if indeed, would indeed have been based on law, right? For, he, let me go back to that. Verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? No, because it, it wasn't, it wasn't an either or. It wasn't, oh, it used to be by faith. Now it's by works. No. Uh, for if a law had been given that was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. If the law could have given us life, then that would have been the basis of our salvation. But it's not, because the law can't do it. That's the whole point. Now listen to what he says. But the scripture has confined everyone under sin. So what's he saying there? All sin did was put us in prison. The scriptures clarifying what sin is and what it isn't. That's why Paul said, man, before the law, I, I didn't know what sin was. And then when I, when I saw the law, it was like, wow. And all of a sudden I was drawn. My human nature, my depravity began to surface. And it was like all I could think about was doing wrong. You and I have been there. It's incapable of giving life because it has no part in the promise. This is his point. The law has no part in the promise. It's always by faith, not by faith plus your good little works. Why? Because your works are as filthy rags. And compared to God, the best we can offer is still garbage. In our own flesh, there's nothing that we can derive that will merit favor with God. Nothing. We need Christ. This is the whole point. Its point is to prove the need for faith in God. All sin did was put us in a prison. 
That's what it did. That's what verse 22 says. But the scripture has confined everyone under sin. Why? So that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So that God could be gracious and merciful. Because we realized that he could, the wrath of God could come. But he's merciful. He's not going to give us what we deserve. Why? Because the mediator, Christ now at that point, who is who is the mediator of a better covenant, right? He steps in, and because of him, we have access now to the Father. And so he says, so that the promise by faith in Jesus might be given to those of us who believe. So those of us who believe that we are sinners and we cannot save ourselves, we simply repent of that. I can't do it. And God, when we believe that, by faith, we receive Christ and the Spirit of Christ. And this is Paul's argument why we are utterly helpless. If God doesn't help, help ain't come. Our salvation, if it's dependent on me, I'm toast, right? That's why there's what we call eternal security. If I could lose my salvation... I would do that. I mean, we would. We all would. If, if it was possible that we could lose it, then we would certainly do that because we keep diving into sin. That's the message today. Man, I got a lot more to say, but we'll wait till Monday. You guys have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you then.